Good morning. We are so glad to see that you braved the cold with us. It is so cold. I was looking around. I was looking for Elsa because it is frozen out there. I was, I was looking at Kennedy. She rolls her eyes when I do these, do these dad jokes. But I was like, it is so cold. She's like, Dad, it's not that cold. I'm like, I'm cold. So we are so glad you are here. Um, first off, uh, I would like to welcome anybody who is new um, to uh, look down at your uh, pew. We have actually cut out in actual, they can actually fit into the pews now. Our little welcome uh, card for you. If you could fill that bad boy out for me, it's something simple. Um, and then just drop it in the offering box in the back when we're done. Uh, we would love to do that. Um, if there's anything you would love to pray about or ask us for, you can write that on the back too. We'd love to just hear from you. Or if you're someone who's been here a long time and just said, hey, you know what? I need to start getting my membership kicking. Um, we'd love to at least get to know you and talk to you about that. Um, so I'm glad you're here. Glad you could be here. Um, one more thing I want to point out, and it's actually on there right now at three o'clock today. We do have our board game uh, hangout. Now, I need to point this out. I am fully aware there is a Dallas Cowboys game at 3.30. Okay, so I will make this to you. I will have the game on at some point on the screen or somewhere in the, in the, in the room. So you can have, watch the game also if you would like to join us for these board games. And you can still watch the Cowboys hopefully demolish the 49ers. So would you all pray with me as we get, we get started? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you do, all that you are. You are a great God that gives us great gifts. I thank you for giving us this church and giving us this family. I pray that we can be, continue to be a blessing to this community and be an outreach and a beacon of light and hope for the lost around us. I pray you guide our hearts as we continue into worship and let us understand and have a deeper wisdom of who you are. We love you and we say this in your name. Amen. We stand together as we sing.
this morning. Let's just go through a few of our names. Uh, we're still remembering uh, Sam and Phyllis Allen, uh, Barbara uh, Cope, Carrie Hong, I think she's with us today, um, uh, Bill Markham, um, Renetta Owens, Carol and Lonzo uh, uh, Rains and Lonzo and, and Janelle Roberts, Lynn Stanley and Betty Toes, uh, Jennifer Hargood, we've been praying for some time. Uh, this last week has passed away. Uh, we remember her family and the friends and uh, the ones in, there. Uh, some of our other friends that are in the hospital, uh, Susan uh, Ferris, a friend of Diane Cutler, uh, Herb Owens and uh, brother Pat Moore, Bert Herman. Uh, he is now, uh, not only is he suffering with some illness, he's also come down with COVID. Uh, that's the husband of Di, uh, and she had just had her, last week, uh, had her shoulder totally redone. All the muscles were gone, and they had to reattach them. And so uh, not only is she trying to take care of herself, but she's trying to take care of him just with one, one hand. And so you, you pray for that family. Uh, we're still praying for our place the replacement team on how we're going to be doing our finances and, and the structure of our building. Let's continue to remember for that team as we pray with our pastor as we begin to work on, on that. And then there's uh, Tracy Kraft is a friend of Diane Cutler. Uh, uh, Stephen Cutler and, uh, and both of them have uh, COVID. We want to continue to remember that that disease is affecting our community. Uh, and uh, Jocelyn uh, Michaels, Joanne, uh, sister of Joanne Pollers. And so we want to continue to uh, just lift our church as we uh, continue to look what we and how we fit into this community. Uh, times have changed. Uh, our position is, is changing in, in the way that we're set up. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost a, a sister church next door um, due to the economy and everything, they, they have closed their doors. Uh, the, the Church of Christ across the street has closed their doors. Let's pray that God continues to work in our lives, that we have new buildings, new families, new homes that are being built around us, that we can reach them for Jesus Christ. And it's going to be our effort to getting out to do that. They're not going to come in on their own. Uh, but we need to be ministering and reaching out. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you. Father, for these that we have mentioned this morning. Father, for the lives of each one that's in this building this morning. Father, we got a message that's been put on the heart of our pastor. Father, we pray that as we listen to the music that we've had, that we joined in the singing, and Father, the words that he's going to bring to us. Father, you work through them. 
to tell us what we need to be doing. Father, show us the vision that you have for us. Father, show us what you want us to, each one of us to do individually. Father, we just thank you for this commitment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we sing a, a beautiful new hymn, hymn, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. It sings of Christ's never-ending grace, mercy, and love. We know it's new for many of us. Choir will lead us. We invite you to join in with us as you feel comfortable with the melody. You'll see the words on the screen, and we invite you to worship with us. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I will my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can see all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will
Let's begin in prayer this morning. As the choir just sung for us, Lord, our prayer is highest praises, honor, and glory be unto your name. Worthy are you, worthy is the one who was slain on our behalf. And so, Lord, we ask that as we inhabit your sanctuary, Lord, and as you inhabit our hearts, may you speak clearly and convictingly today, and may you change our tomorrow. Lord, we love you, and we ask you to do what only you want to do this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. As you have probably come to realize, I am a pretty passionate person. Uh, I get obsessed about things, I get fixated on things, I get excited about things. That was no more apparent than when we were moving about two or three weeks ago. I began to see the history of all of these firework passions that I have. See, I call them fireworks because they shoot off and they're really awesome for about a second. And then they fizzle out. And you're left, instead of with the dust in the air, you're left with dust collecting on them around the house, right? I remember going through just the other day, and we threw away the whole box set of P90X, the workout regimen, right? Pretty sure we used it about 15 times. Um, Not swole or buff or a marine yet. Um, there uh, There were kitchen gadgets that I thought, Carlin, this will revolutionize our cooking experience, and they now just take up counter space and cabinets. But probably the biggest one for me (laughs) when we were thinking back over this was uh, right after we moved to College Station five years ago, College Station's a really compact town, I decided the best way to get around there was not a car like normal people, I decided I was going to become a cyclist. (laughs) She remembers this passion, doesn't she? (laughs) I was going to become a cyclist. So I researched and researched and researched the best road bike because it was so easy to get around. Everything's three miles away. I could then get on campus. You know, they have all those blockades and all that. I could ride a bike anywhere. I could get anywhere. It was the best way to meet students, the best way to get around. But I quickly learned after buying the bicycle that um, I didn't really enjoy riding a bike that much. Uh, That even though it's a pretty flat area in Texas, the hills still were pretty challenging to climb. And then every time you got somewhere, you were drenched in sweat. I bought the bike in November, rode it a little bit through the winter and realized the sweat was going to be a problem. I never even tried it during the summer. Soon I got the excuse of, well, we have a kid now, I need a car seat. He can't ride the bike to school with me yet. So that passion fizzled out. But I'm sure that you have a story as well, right? Uh, maybe yours isn't a bicycle or an Instant Pot or uh, a P90X disc set, but I'm sure you have those things that you bought and you said, this is going to revolutionize it. QVC got you. They got your 1995 and four payments. You got three of them, right? And they threw in extras, and now it just sits and collects dust. It's an eyesore around the house, or it's just one more money pit for you, right? We have those pursuits we thought were going to be worthwhile. And then we realized that they weren't really worth it. But see, pursuits aren't bad. We need pursuits. A life without a pursuit or a passion is dull and boring. We need pursuits. Some of you pursue these very specific things, like I'm going to run a marathon. All right, That's never going to be me. Some of you pursue, I want to get that job, or I want to marry that woman, or I want to live in that neighborhood. You have all these pursuits. Some of you have generic pursuits. I want today to go well. I want to stay healthy. I want to avoid that virus. I I want to pursue happiness or joy. We, We have these things. A lot of times we look and we see the world is pursuing money and careers. But pursuits, what really matters? Like, what should our pursuit be in? Last week, we started off this series on pursuits, and we first, before we ever think about our pursuits, we need to understand and appreciate and realize that we are pursued by God, that He loved us first, that He came to us. We said Romans 5.8, right? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
1 John builds on this. Chapter 4, verse 10, it says, And this is love. Not that God, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and He sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Revelation 3, Jesus is speaking to the church, and He says, I stand at the door and knock. Behold, I am here. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door and lets me in, I will come and eat with them and they with me. God pursues us. Our pursuit of God, as we're going to talk about today, is preceded, as we talked about last week, by His pursuit of us. He loved us first. He sought us first. He comes to us. Even think about the disciples. They didn't go, oh, this new rabbi in town, I want to go follow him. No, remember Jesus called out to them, follow me. And then they left everything. He meets them on the boat or at the tax collector booth. They leave everything. They surrender everything. They follow him fully. But it starts with his call. And so this morning, before we can get into how we pursue Christ, there are some probably in this room that maybe you don't understand who Jesus is and you have not given him the full leadership and lordship of your life. A pursuit of Christ without Him being your Lord and Savior makes no sense. It will just be a fruitless burden. Only pursuing Christ only makes sense if He is your Savior and your Lord. And most of us sit in this room today and go, He is my Savior and Lord. Then the only thing that makes sense for us is to pursue Him every day. To spend our life loving Him as He loved us. And so what, how do we do this? How do we pursue Christ? How do we spend our life following a person that's not walking on this earth? How do we live our life in a manner that honors the one who gave his life for us? See, how do we pursue Christ? Religion will say, learn a bunch of these things, follow these rules, do this certain step, and then you may be good enough. But what does Christ say? Our primary text today is John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. John chapter 15. What does Jesus say? How do you pursue me? How do you build relationship with me? He says this, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. How do we pursue Christ? We are in relationship. We are in abiding. We are deeply connected, fully connected, dependently connected on Him every single day. We abide with Him. We take up residence is really what that means, to take up residence with Him. Verse 5, let's continue on. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. So do we want to be fruitful in our life? Do we want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness coming out of us? Gentleness and self-control, just in case we thought I was going to get called out on that. Do we want those things flowing from us? Well, how do we do that? We abide in Christ. We take up residence with Him and allow Him to take up residence in our life. And then it says at the very end, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Without a deep connectivity, we will fail. We will struggle. We will be unable to do the things that we want to do. But you may go, Jordan, I need a little more specifics. I've heard abide before. But that's a real theoretical word. That's not a modern term. What does this mean? I like looking back at Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. He's taking over for Moses. He's terrified. He's overwhelmed. He's unsure of himself. Moses was the man that was given the Ten Commandments and all the law. Moses was this awesome person of God. And now Joshua is stepping in. And what does he say? He says to him in verse 8. In verse 7 he says, Be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all that the law uh, Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from the left or the right from it, that you will have good success. Verse 8 says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you'll be careful to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So Jesus says, Abide. Spend time with me. Be deeply connected with me. Lean on to me. Trust in me. Joshua was giving very practical advice. Spend time in the Word. Now, he was only given the first five books 
all right? Understanding the character of God and the Word of God. I think we can open all the books, all right? He had a, a short little bit to look at, but we have all of this text to, to spend our days holding to and clinging to, meditating on, not letting it depart from us. But it's not just the Old Testament. In Acts 2, the early church is forming. Jesus has come and just changed their paradigm of understanding. He, he has shown up, and so they're saying, we want to honor God, and this is His Word, but also we want to live in a manner that is understanding who Jesus is and what He has done. And so what does it say in verse 42 of chapter 2 of Acts? It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And an awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through them. Here's the word I want us to hear today. It's that third word. They devoted themselves to the teaching, to the word. Joshua was meditating on it day and night. Jesus says, abide in it all the time. The apostles' teaching, they say, be devoted to it. That word devoted is really neat. It means to attend constantly, to continue steadfastly. This isn't a one time, okay, I did it, I'm good. No, it's a daily pursuit. It's continuing over and over, persisting. I even like how it gets, it says, with an intense effort. How many of our spiritualities would be described as, he was intensely following Jesus? My fear is more of us, it would be he passively followed Jesus. He spontaneously or sporadically, intermittently followed Jesus instead of intensely. See, this following of Jesus is not just, well, I prayed a prayer and I am good. It's not a one-time achievement and then we carry in our wallet for insurance anytime that we need it. No, as Eugene Peterson says, and you'll hear me say this all the time, to be a disciple of Jesus, to follow Jesus, is a long obedience in the same direction. It's a daily pursuit. Always aimed pursuing Him, just trying to catch up and to follow Him. The early church was devoted. Joshua was meditating day and night. Jesus is calling His disciples to abide, and yet when I look over the American church, I do not see Bible people. 60% of our country claims to be a Christian, yet less than 36% of those people even open the Word once a week. How can we claim something with our eternal destiny and yet never look into it during the days? How can we call ourselves a follower of Christ and not engage His words? Not engage Him? Maybe that's why we prefer to say that we're Christians instead of followers of Christ. Because we're good at doing Christian things. We're good at going to church, having a letter somewhere. We may be good at giving. We may have even taught a class. We're good at doing Christian things. But how well are we following Christ? See, Christianity says know the books in order. Paraphrase a few things and you can get by if somebody asks you, to bring something up. Just show up and you're good. But Jesus calls us to abide, to spend our time deeply connected in a pursuit of Him. He says that these words are a daily guide to your life. And yet all they typically do is sit and collect dust on the American Christian shelf. See, so many of us are focused on Christianity doing well at religion, and we've forgotten to follow Christ. Some of us need to unlearn Christianity in order to follow Christ because we're busying our time so much with religion and we have forgotten relationship. Abiding is about relationship, not checking boxes. I was reading a few years ago a book by a guy named David Platt. He's a pastor in Virginia. And he said, you know, I'm looking out over the landscape of modern church. He says there's massive buildings. He says there's programs just about every night of the week for anybody and everybody. Every age group is covered. He said there is arguments or rules about what you can wear, what you shouldn't wear, what you wear to this church but not to that church. 
He says, we argue over which songs are the right ones to sing, which ones are really sacred. There's disputes even over carpet colors. And then he said, is this what Jesus had in mind when he established the church 2,000 years ago? Do you think denominational divide, disputes over song selection, questions over, well, this translation's better than that translation, or he's not wearing this, so we can't let him sit here. Is this what Jesus had in mind when he established the church to push back the, the effects of hell and Satan in our world? To usher in the people of God into the kingdom of God? Is this really what he had in mind? Is Jesus really honored if I wear a button-down shirt, but I stand during the time of worship and don't speak a word of praise to Him? Is Jesus really proud that I have a membership letter at a church, and yet nobody would know that I live in a way that honors Him? Is Jesus really proud that my Bible has my name on it, but I couldn't name the last time I opened it? See, the church, we are so good at checking the boxes, and yet so poor oftentimes at pursuing the relationship with our Savior. Church, I want to invite you to stop focusing on the rules of religion and start pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ where we are abiding, where we are seeking out His words. Most of you Bibles, they're in red, so they're pretty easy to find. Right? Learn His words. Meditate. Sit in them. Think over them. Consider them. We need to prioritize prayer. I sat in a Sunday school this morning, and it was just amazing. They were saying, I wonder sometimes, does God just get tired of me showing up in prayer? And I'm sitting there going, wow, what if all the believers of God were that persistent in prayer, that trusting, that obedient, that that uh, consistent in their trust of Him. You know, sometimes I wonder if the circumstances that are burdening us and a problem for us are actually because of our disobedience and our distrust. Because we don't pursue Christ, we are living in ways that are in opposition of Him that maybe we're causing calamity. Think back throughout the Scriptures. Remember when uh, Abraham rushes into a problem-solving place and so he says... I'm going to take Hagar and have a son, and I can answer all of God's problems. But do you remember the problem that came out of Esau and the Edomites? They were a thorn in Israelites in the Israel side the rest of the time. Why? Because of the calamity of distrust that, that came about. Maybe the things we are experiencing are due to a lack of abiding in God and trusting Him daily. Too many of us claim to follow something because we show up on Sunday, but we never show up on a weekday to what God is calling us and wanting to speak to us. So let's get honest. Does abide really work? Does spending time in the Word, does pursuing Christ really affect our lives at all? First, let's see what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 13, it says this, Evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Everybody in this room can say, yes, that's the truth. Evil people is more evil than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He's saying you have been given the truth. Hold to it. Remember it. What you were taught at such an early age, those stories aren't just stories for you to know. They're not fairy tales or to help you go to sleep. No, they are stories to give you hope and belief and faith that your God is the God who can cause it to rain and cause it to stop. Uh, good job, bud. But gets this, verse 16. All Scripture. Does, does spending time in the Word matter? All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for training and righteousness. All Scripture has value to us. It is profitable for us. We need this. 
in very practical ways to teach us, to train us, to correct us. Why? Verse 17, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. There is a purpose in these words to equip us for what God has in store for us. Do we believe that? Now, the Bible makes promises about itself, but what about some data, right? We're data-driven people. What about data? The Center of Biblical Engagement did a study. And what they learned is that the people that engage the Word of God four times or more in a week have drastically different lives. People that engage four times a week so almost every other day, honestly. They have statistically completely different answers. It says that these people are 30% less lonely. We live not only in a pandemic right now, but there's an epidemic also of mental health illnesses right now affecting. I guarantee you everybody's family in this room has an effect in that way. And I am not saying that the only answer is the word, but it is part of the solution. There are need for mental health professionals, but also we need to be engaging this as we are fighting against depression and anxiety and uh, awful thoughts that just wreck in our mind. These people, they engage the word. They're 30% less likely to be uh, lonely. They're 59% less likely to uh, view pornography. We want to combat sin. This is how we can start doing this. This is running rampant in our culture. And yet, we have an answer. How do we combat this? But let's be positive, too. People that are engaging the Word four times or more in a week are 228% more likely to share about Jesus. We all want opportunities. Well, maybe we need to spend some time where we have some things to share. And catch this. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 28 as He was leaving the disciples? He said, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. People that engage the Word four times or more in a week are 231% more likely to be discipling somebody. If we want those things in our life to be combating sin, pursuing Jesus, sharing about Jesus, and discipling others in Him, maybe we need to be in the Word. Engaging His Word each week is the single most beneficial life-altering, peace-providing, marriage-stabilizing, sin-combating, life-equipping activity that you and I can do every single day. No diet, no person, no job, no gym can provide or promise what engaging the Word of God can do. But the question is, will we Will we listen to this? Here's what I'm going to tell you. At First Baptist, we are going to be a church that expects you to be engaging the Word. We expect it of you. We expect you to be sitting in the words of life that have been given to us. We expect you to be reading and praying, to be listening to God. We expect you not just to be good Christians, but devoted followers of Christ, daily pursuing Him. Nobody is too busy. Nobody is too old, too young, too distracted. No, we expect this of you. But we don't just expect of things of you. We also promise to walk alongside you and to help you, and to encourage you, and equip you along the way. We promise to provide Bible reading plans and accountability, ideas to build habits, encouragement to persevere when it gets hard, or to restart when you haven't done it in a while. This is not going to be a place of shame over what you haven't done, but celebration over what you're going to do. All right, We are a place that not only expects of you, but we promise to be people walking alongside of you and helping you in every single facet of your life, but especially in engaging His Word because we know that it is powerful to change our lives. And so we promise to walk alongside you. We're going to help you and equip you, and we're going to celebrate with you when Jesus is working in, through, and around you. For some of you guys, it's a need to change your priorities. Because I fall into that trap all the time. It's just so much easier sometimes to flip on the television, to scroll through my phone, or to get distracted with something that needs to be done around the house. For some of you, you're going to say, I'm just too busy. Okay? 
Can I borrow your phone and let me see your screen time? Can I get your phone log and just kind of just see uh, how much time we spent on that? Or, you know, that Cowboys game that's coming up at 3.30, right in the middle of game time? Uh, we're not too busy. Let's just be honest. We're just not interested. Maybe you do go, man, I just, so much is going on. Use your time. Use your commutes. Use walks. Listen to the Word. Nobody ever said you have to read it. Just said engage it. Be in the Word. I think, though, the biggest thing, and let's close with this. I think the biggest barrier for people engaging the Word is they go, Jordan, I've tried. And every time I open, you know, I just do this, and I just trust the Lord leading here. And then I get to something, and I have no clue what's going on. Like, I don't know why we're so mad at Tyre and Sidon, but, you know, I'm going to get behind that. We're going to be really mad at them because they are not doing what God said to do. But that doesn't relate to me at all. So here's, you know, I think that that's a tough barrier, but we, we, we can overcome it. And so uh, a few years ago, I was doing youth ministry just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And I realized that we had told our, our, our high school students, or middle school and high school students, we want you to have a quiet time, right? Everybody hears that. And then they go, well, what's that? if they're bold enough to even ask. They just assumed that that was taught in some secret class of Sunday school that they didn't get to attend that day, and so, you know, they've just missed out the rest of life. But I decided that what to read, how much to read, and what did I just read were the biggest problems facing our high schools and middle school students. So I said, let me take that away from you. And so I created a weekly devotional um, website where they would know what to read, how much to read, and even some thoughts on what did you, what maybe could you have gotten out of this reading? And what was really neat is that middle school and high school students, who most people just, you know, push away, they're not going to do it. Maybe when they get older, more mature. They would come in, and, and if they read all four days that week, we had a little bowl of paint, and I think I cleared this with our pastor. I don't know if I did or not. But they would dip their finger in paint, and they would put it on the doorpost. Because in Deuteronomy it says to teach the word to your children, to train them, to have this on your mouth and lips every day. But it says also paint your doorpost. And so when we left there, we'd been doing that for a little over a year. We had two doorposts, kind of like those double doors, completely full. As a memorial of students who had committed that week to be engaging the word of God. Only if you did all four days. There were plenty of students that did two, three days. We didn't shame them. We still celebrated that, but that was the memorial. It, it was a place to remember that everybody should be expected of this. And then there's one more story I want to tell as we close. Uh, about three years ago, I was leading a freshman Bible study in, on A&M's campus. And while we were there, um, I had a student. It was November. We'd been meeting for three months. I had a student. He said... Can I just tell y'all something? He said, for the first time in my life, this morning I read my Bible. And he said, and I want to do it again tomorrow. And then he started kind of getting down on himself. He said, you know, I know all y'all probably all done that before and all this. And I stopped him immediately. And I said, before you continue, I said, guys, there was about 10 guys in that room. How many of you read your Bible for the very first time at some point this semester? Three or four raised their hands. It was a reminder that it doesn't matter where we start or what, I mean, our history. What matters is are we willing to start? In this pursuit of Christ that I am calling you to, some of you run at a pace way faster than me. Please keep encouraging me. Some of you go, man, there was a day when I was running and I was training and all of this and it was great, but I've kind of fallen away. I've broken rhythm. And I encourage you, restart. Some of you go, I've never done this before in my life because I've always tried to read and I just didn't know what I was getting out of it. Will you start for the first time engaging the Word because abiding Him, apart from Him we can do nothing. Abiding with Him is how we grow, is how we live the life that we want to live and it has major effects on our lives. So my question this morning simply is, will you abide? Will you pursue Christ? Will you be devoted?
continue steadfastly day after day after day? Will you not let the Word of God depart from you? Will you seek Him? Will you pray? Will you listen? Will you read? Will you obey? Will you pursue the one who pursued you first? We're not called to passive attendance of a church, but of an active pursuit of a Savior. My question is, will you be a firework that shoots off into the sky and fizzles out really quickly after a day? Or will your hope and prayer and focus be to be like a lantern that burns all through the night, shining a light that's not just a glimmer, but a beacon for people to see who Jesus is and how he's working in you daily. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I pray today that as we have opened your word and understood from John 15, that apart from you, we can do nothing. But as we are connected to the vine, that we will be fruitful and we will be used by you. Lord, I pray this morning that we as a church grasp the importance of this expectation of pursuing you because we know that this is the only way for us to know you and to follow you. So, Lord, I pray now that you will speak to our hearts and you will convict us and challenge us and encourage us as we go. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you are... uh, If God's working on you in any way, maybe you say, like at the very beginning, I said, you know, if if you've never given your life to Christ, it makes no sense to pursue Him. I would love to speak with someone if, if they go, you know, I want to give my life to Him as my Savior and Lord. For others of you, you go, Jordan, I feel that shame of stale spirituality. Maybe you need some prayer today to be encouraged because we're not going to shame you over your past, but encourage you in your present to go and to chase after him and to pursue him. Maybe you just need to stand in worship as we do this. We're going to sing just as I am. And that's how we come to Jesus as we are, but knowing that he accepts us as we are, not as we should be. And so however you need to respond, I'll be down front. And I encourage you to do what God is working inside of you, however he is calling you to respond, to respond. So let's stand and sing.
So, as I said, we're not just expecting of you, but we're walking alongside of you and we promise to help you in this. And so one thing that I just want to let you know is it's on the way out. I think Ron's got him, I think, right there. Yes. On the way out is a devotional for this week. It is five days of devotions, all right? Some of it's going to be crossovers just because there's only so much content I can create in a week and all that. But uh, so you probably heard it. Maybe you need the reminder. Anyways, it is five days of devotions that if you just need somewhere to start, please pick it up. It, there is, I would encourage you to read more in it that's, than what is just there. Read the whole chapter. It's only just small segments of Scripture. Read that. One thing also, I printed off some of those. There they are back there. But I'm also going to be emailing them out some this week, early in the morning. We will set it up. And so that way it can hit your email as a reminder. Um, and we just want this. That's the, one of the best things I can do to help us to pastor you is to point you to Christ and point you to his words. And so that's really what we're going to be doing. So we have that going on. Please join us at three today. It's going to be a beautiful day. Come on. I want to see a Cowboys game with Cowboys fans. Uh, see if y'all are as rabid as Alabama fans are with Alabama games. And so uh, come play games with us. Cooper's already planning uh, if he's going to play Old Maid or Go Fish. So uh, there's a skill level for everybody to come into play. Uh, so uh, yeah, come and join us three o'clock. We're going to be in, in a coffee house area. Um, I think that's about all we have. Uh, if you call the office tomorrow, uh, with it being uh, Martin Luther King Day and with school being closed, the office is going to be closed tomorrow just to let you know. Um, we'll check our voicemail the next day uh, or send us an email if you need something urgently. We're always available to you. So let me pray for us as we go. Lord, may we come to you as we are and may we pursue you as we are. And Lord, as we pursue you, Lord, as we draw near to you, as you promise in James, will you draw near to us? And may you make this week a week in our lives where we hear from you clearly and convictingly, and may you change our lives this week as we interact with your word. Lord, we love you. Be with us as we go. It's in your name we pray. Amen.